swimming past their ship, but keep swimming. And they're watching it. And it's going past their ship, and more past their ship, and more past their ship, above the water, the back of this huge whale, which is ten times the length of their ship. And they go, oh, okay, let's just hope that he doesn't, like, you know, destroy our ship. Satan is pictured as being this massive. It's a beautiful word picture in, in the mind's eye. Notice now we're on page 532. So, line 209. So stretched out huge in length the arch fiend lay, chained on the burning lake, nor ever thence had risen or heaved his head, but that the will and high permission of all ruling heaven left him at large to his own dark designs. Let's pause for a moment and point out. Milton says, God knows exactly what's happening and lets Satan do it. Let's Satan do it. In other words, God is omnipotent, knows everything, so nothing can fool or, or surprise God. That with reiterated crimes, line 215, he might heap on himself damnation while he sought evil to others and enraged might see how all his malice served but to bring forth infinite goodness, grace, and mercy shown on men by him seduced, but on himself treble confusion, wrath, and vengeance poured. Let's just pause for a moment here and point out what Milton's theology is. He says, God allows Satan to do all these terrible things so good may come out of it in Christian theology. This will be later, of course, Jesus Christ coming to the world. So Milton is going to walk a very interesting fine line. He is going to say, no, no, God knew exactly what Satan was going to do in coming into the Garden of Eden and screwing everything up. But in the end, it was for God's purpose. It was for good. It's an interesting argument. Of course, it's going to be much debated as the years will unfold after Milton, right? Let's keep reading now. I'm at line 221. Forthwith, upright, he rears Satan. Rears from off the pool his mighty stra um, st um, stature. On each hand, the flames driven backwards, slope their pointing spires, and rolled in billows, leave in the midst a horrid veil. He's covered with fire as he then comes up off of the lake of fire. Then, with expanded wings, he opens up his wings, large burning wings. He steers his flight aloft, incumbent on the dusky air that felt unusual weight till on dry land he lights if it were land that ever burned with solid as with as the lake with liquid fire and such appeared in hue as when the force of subterranean wind transports a hill torn from Pelorus or the shattered side of thundering Etna, whose combustible and fueled entrails thence receiving fire, sublimed with mineral fury, aid the winds and leave a singed bottom all involved with stench and smoke. Pause for a moment. Another powerful word picture. When Satan comes off of the lake of fire and he opens his wings, it's like Etna, a volcano erupting. The fire all around him as he then flies through the air to land on the ground. It looks like a huge mountain, right? Etna has flown on fire because Satan is so large, right? Of course, Milton would point out and will point out many times later that if this is how large and scary Satan is and God defeated Satan and threw him out of heaven, then therefore this is how amazing God must be, Milton's theology, right? Such resting, line 238, such resting found the soul of unblessed feet. Him followed the next mate, both glorying to have escaped the Stygian flood as gods and by their own recovered strength, not by the sufferance of supernal power. Now we will back to quotes again. Take a look here. Is this the region, Satan, this the soil, the climb, said then the lost archangel, this the seat that we must change for heaven, top of 533. This mournful gloom for that celestial light. In other words, he, he lands off of the fiery lake. He lands. And he looks around at the badlands. It's total darkness. It's a, it's a horrifically bad place. And he goes, is this what we left from heaven? Beautiful in heaven. Now, here, nothing. Nasty place to be. Be it so, like uh, uh, top of page two, uh, 533, line 246, 245, 246. Be it so, 
Since he who now is sovereign can dispose and bid what shall be right. Furthest from him is best. In other words, he says, I am so glad we're far away from God, God in heaven, because I don't want to be anywhere near such a powerful enemy. Whom reason hath equaled, force hath made supreme above his equals. Now, these famous lines again for Satan. Farewell, happy fields, where joy forever dwells. Hail, horrors. Hail, infernal world. And thou, profoundest hell, receive thy new possessor. And then look what he says about himself. One who brings a mind not to be changed by place or time. The mind, look what he says. Now we're at line 254. I hope you write these lines down in your annotations. These are famous lines. The, line, the mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell, a hell of heaven. Let's pause for a moment at level one and write down what we just read. What does he say about the mind? It's interesting, the mind. He says the mind is a very special place. The mind can make a really good place a terrible place. And a really terrible place a really good place. In other words, it all depends on your mind. What is it that Hamlet will say? There is no, nothing good or ill but thinking makes it so. In other words, Satan says, hey, guys, look at this. Yes, I know this doesn't look like where we were, heaven, that amazing place, but we can make something out of this place. We can do something remarkable out of this place. Keep reading with me, line 533. Uh, Notice he says, what, uh, I'm sorry, uh, line 257. What matter where, if I be still the same, and what I should be, all but less than he whom thunder hath made greater. In other words, he says, guys, it doesn't matter whether I'm in heaven or whether I'm in hell. I'm the same Satan no matter what. Let's put it in your notes at level one. What he's really saying is, you cannot change my nature. It is that famous teleology that you often hear people say today. It is what it is. I am what I am. I'm not changing. Being thrown out of heaven, down here in hell, is not going to change me. Notice how heroic these words sound. If spoken by normal epic heroes, like Beowulf, who says something kind of similar when he's stuck down in Grendel's mother's cave, we would say, wow, that's right, way to go. You got to be strong. You got to fight. You got to be able to not, you know, give in so easy. Carpe diem, seize the day. All of that. Notice here, though, these are words spoken by the archfiend Satan. I'm with you on page 533. We'll continue with the irony, right? What manner where if I still be the same? And what I should be all but less than he whom thunder hath made greater. Here at least, he says about hell, we shall be free the Almighty hath not built here, for his envy will not drive us hence. Here we may regain, we, here we may reign secure. And in my choice, these of course become some of the most famous quoted lines, to reign is worth ambition though in hell. Top of page 534. Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. Let's write those lines down. Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. In other words, he says, I would rather be here in hell where I have my freedom to do what I want than to be stuck in heaven where I have to bow down to that disgusting God. I'd much rather be here. This is a better place for me to be. Very heroic sounding, right? Very heroic sounding. But to finish these lines on 534, but wherefore? Let we then, our faithful friends, the associates and co-partners of our loss, lie thus astonished on the oblivious pool, and call them not to share with us their part in this unhappy mansion, or once more with railed arms, to try what may be yet regained in heaven, or what more lost in hell. In other words, he says, let's have a bit of a think here. I think, I, I think we can come up with a plan that will allow us to get God back. Now, your passage here stops. These lines go on for 11,000 more lines of the very thing that you've read. Now, let's go ahead and just point out a couple of things really quickly for our annotations as we finish up our introduction here to Paradise Lost. Let's begin, first of all, at 2A, possible messages themes. This is problematic. This is problematic. Let's list several of them. One, Obviously here, we have Milton the poet saying, 
I want to tell a story that explains why terrible things happen in the world. That is the theodicy project that we've mentioned in earlier lectures, right? Two, the way he says I'm going to do that is I'm going to go back to the beginning of time. At the beginning of time, we will be dealing with that whole story about Adam and Eve in the garden. Everything that's bad in the world is explained there, and I'm going to explain how that happens. Three, the idea is simply this. Let's write it at level 2A because it's an important one. God is not to blame. Now, this will be, of course, a hugely contested argument, but notice the genius of Milton. The minute you say God is to blame, you start to sound like what character from this poem? Right? See how that works? If you say terrible things happen in the world and it's God's fault because God created human beings and put them in this garden in the first place, you immediately start to sound like our, right, our character from this poem, Satan. Right? Finally, let's point out how Milton seems to personify Satan as heroic. He's thrown out of heaven to hell, but the first thing he says is, this is fine, not a worry. Whatever happens, we're going to keep fighting. I am much happier here in hell because here I can be F-R-E-E. -E. Whoa, 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 wait a second. Is freedom a good thing or a bad thing? Every time I begin lecturing on American history to my American Lit students in the junior year, I always point out that if you need a single line to really kind of encapsulate Americans, it is simply this line, don't tell me what to do. Anyone who comes to visit, for example, America will often say this about Americans. You Americans, you're very independent-minded. And we will often report, well, yeah. What is it that we say? The land of the free in the home of the brave, right? That is to say, freedom is everything to us. Notice here, Satan, he says, I would rather be in hell where I can make up my own mind. I don't have somebody telling me what to do. I don't want anybody telling me what to do. The rebellious spirit, the rebellious spirit is, of course, one that we identify often as being bad. But notice here, Satan, it seems kind of quasi-heroic. Milton playing a very dangerous game here that was not missed by his contemporaries. There were many people who said that Milton was doing something actually anti-religious, irreligious, opposite to Christianity. Of course, you have to read the entire poem to be able to recognize the ways in which Milton is playing the game that ultimately is his conservative Christian theology. Let's jump to, to B now. We've already pointed out a number of things here. Let's make sure we've got it in our notes. Obviously, we're looking at an epic. Obviously, we're looking at a uh, blank, again, verse, iambic pentameter, right? Notice we don't have the rhyme scheme, but we definitely have that better to reign in heaven, uh, better to reign in hell than serve in heaven, ba-bum, 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 ba-bum. So all of, that is, all of that is in play. Obviously, we've got an epic here in regards to an epic hero, or do we? That I do want you to write down in your notes at 2B. Clearly, Milton is playing games with the construction of the epic itself. No question about it, right? No question about it. All right, let's jump to level three and how we can relate to this. It is an easy thing, obviously, at 3A, to jot down any number of titles that come to mind. We have already mentioned those major epics, the Iliad, the Odyssey, Virgil's Aeneid, the, the Beowulf epic. But now I'd like for you to turn to some of those other kinds of films, right, that come to mind for you. Especially, let's write down those villains that are actually kind of like heroic and cool, right? So, for example, we have Darth Vader that we mentioned before from our, uh, from our uh, Star Wars films, right? Uh, we've got the, uh, the other character from X-Men, right? Where, how are we going to say it? Go ahead and say it for us. Magneto. Magneto. My apologies for mispronouncing earlier, right? I should probably get out to movies more often, you see, right? But think about some of the other ones that come to mind. Can you think about, for example, a number of years ago, there was a famous movie called Silence of the Lambs, which created a lot of stir. It won an Academy Award, but the hero of the film is this really, really scary bad guy, Hannibal Lecter. This idea that you can kind of make a really bad guy and kind of celebrate that bad guy in some way? What is your favorite movie where that happens, right? Where that happens. 
Finally, let's jump to 2B. I'm sorry, to 3B. And personal relationships to this. How do you deal with the idea that freedom, don't tell me what to do, is the mantra of Satan? Satan. That is to say, don't tell me what to do is, of course, a bad thing if you don't, if, I mean, if you, if you don't believe Satan, you know, if, if you believe Satan is a bad guy. And yet, we can hear this language and we can kind of appreciate it as being kind of like, you know, strong, you know, independent minded. So let's ask a couple of questions here. Do you think it's better to be in a situation where you're free and have, get to make your own rules? Or is it better to be in a situation where there are rules? If you could construct a world to live in, would you prefer that world to have lots of rules and regulations? Or no rules and regulations. Hmm. Which is the better place to be? For example, notice your language. Seniors will often say this. Dude, I can hardly wait till I graduate because then I can finally leave home and there will be nobody around telling me what to do. Question. Is that true? Is leaving home a situation where no one tells you anymore what to do? Second question. If it is the case that leaving home means less restrictions, is that good or bad? In other words, when you lose those restrictions, then you have no one to blame if things go bad. You are kind of on your own then in ways you've not been in before. Hmm. Finally, let's ask this question. It's a personal question in regards to this. Do you think Milton is going out, is he stepping over a line here? Is he kind of doing something he probably shouldn't be doing? Good idea, bad idea. Let's turn now to page 535 really quickly in this critical commentary. We just want to read this real fast. This is some observations about Milton and Paradise Lost. This will come from two different places. Put it in your notes, please. And here, by the way, I'm working with you at level 3A, right? Relationship to other, to other thinkers. First, we're going to look at what Percy Bysshe Shelley had to say from Defense of Poetry. And then Stanley Fish is surprised by sin, right? Take a look. Read with me. Poets and critics have long debated whether Satan in Paradise Lost is an evil villain or the secret hero of the poem. Romantics like Percy Bysshe Shelley viewed Satan as a heroic, romantic rebel. Let's write that down. Shelley sees Satan as a heroic, romantic hero of a rebel. Writing in 1821, Shelley made the case for that perspective. Let's listen to Shelley's view about Satan as hero. Read with me on 535. By the way, Shelley, a poet that we'll meet in our senior B work. Milton's devil, as a moral being, is as far superior to his God as one who, perserve, who perseveres in some purpose, which he has convinced, conceived to be excellent in spite of adversity and torture, is to one who in the cold security of undoubted triumph inflicts the most horrible revenge upon his enemy, not from any mistaken notion of inducing him to repent of a perverse uh, of, of, a, of a perseverance in enmity, but with the alleged design of exasperating him to deserve new torments. Milton has so far violated the popular creed, if this shall be judged to be a violation, as to have alleged no superiority of moral virtue to his God over his devil. And this bold neglect of a direct moral purpose is the most decisive proof of the supremacy of Milton's genius. I should point out, Shelley is the first one to write a defense of atheism. He is the first in Europe to say, you shouldn't believe in God. It is a crazy idea. Shelley will go back in 1800 to Paradise Lost and say, Milton was on to something. Satan is far more interesting in the poem than is God. Writing exactly 150 years later, I hope you're reading with me on 535, the critic Stanley Fish argued that far from being an admirable rebel, Milton Satan has no will or identity of his own. Read this one with me. Quote, Satan's independence is an illusion because he's in bondage to the freedom to do as he likes, and he becomes the captive of momentary purposes in the plaything of master strategist God, Milton, who make of him what they will. His will does not exist. He has no deepest self. 
except in a satanic never-never land where evil could be someone's good. This reversal is impossible in a universe where God is God. And when Satan admits, myself am hell, he in effect says, myself am not, since hell is the state of disunion from God's sustaining power and hence a state of non-being. Perhaps the most ironic of his boasts is this one. What matters where if I be still the same? The sameness of evil is the sameness of chaos, a stability of instability, where the identity and form of any atom or cluster of atoms is a matter of chance unless an ordering power is imposed. Satan is condemned to restless wandering until God or some deputy of God finds a use for him and endows him with motives and opinions and powers to fit the role imposed from without. Take a look at this question. What admirable qualities does Shelley attribute to Satan? Why does Fish declare that, quote, Satan's independence is an illusion, end quote? Well, there you go. An introduction to Milton and to Paradise Lost. I hope that you someday have the chance to read the rest of the poem. Thank you.